Well, good morning, church, and welcome uh, to everyone who is here with us in person, or if you're with us online, we do extend a greeting and a welcome to you and look forward to worshiping together. Uh, my name is Jeff Kempton, and I am the pastor here at Crossroads, and uh, it is a wonderful day to come and worship. Now, you might notice uh, a couple things that are a little different today. Uh, the first is that I am wearing a mask, and our worship leader, Ryan, is not here today. And what happened is that our youth uh, went off to, to camp at Dunamis this past week, and they had, first they had an exposure there to COVID, so there was some of that being passed around, and then actually one of our students for the drive home, we found out later that day on Friday, um, tested positive as well. So I was exposed to him, no symptoms or anything, um, tested negative myself yesterday, but that was probably kind of early to know for certain, so wearing a mask, trying to keep our distance and, and all of that. Um, but we are thankful to Andrew, who is back with us and leading us in worship, has filled in at the last minute for us, so we are, we are grateful for that. Uh, the students did have a wonderful week at Dunamis, and you'll be hearing more about that in, in the weeks to come and some, some reports on, on the work that God was doing there and God is continuing to do uh, in our youth. Well, we have come to this place to worship our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. We've come because God himself has invited us to be here. Uh, we come with a realization, with a recognition of our own sin, of our own fallenness, of our own brokenness, that we are unworthy vessels. I am an unworthy vessel to bring the word of God, and we are all unworthy vessels to even bring worship to God, but because of his mercy, because of his grace, because of his sacrifice on the cross, now the offerings that we bring to him are made worthy by him and for him and because of him. So we come today as forgiven sinners, as people who are loved and cared for and welcomed by him. So I invite you, would you now please rise with me as we hear together this call to worship, God calling us to worship from Psalm number five. In the morning, Lord, you hear our voice. In the morning, we lay our requests before you and wait expectantly. For you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness. With you, evil people are not welcome. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies. The bloodthirsty and deceitful you, Lord, detest. But we, by your great love, can come into your house. In reverence, we bow down toward your holy temple. Let us pray. Father, we come to bow down to you, to give our, our worship and our praises to you, Lord, to, to be open and honest with you and to recognize our sin and our need for your grace, our need for the salvation that you alone give to us. So, Lord, as we lift our hearts together as one, may this time of worship be honoring and glorifying to you because of who you are, because you are worthy, because you deserve every bit of praise that we can bring. So, Lord, we come to you. We offer you our song. We offer you our hearts. We offer you our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, the one who redeems us and loves us and restores us. In the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.
Well, recently we have um, started to support a, a new ministry that actually has come to our attention through Larry and Donna Willis, and I want to invite them to come up and share a bit about, about this ministry. I know. Good morning, everyone. I'm Donna, and this is Larry. And we first heard about Next Life Foundation through our family church in Michigan. And we had a chance to go to Africa uh, in February of this year and spent a day at the school with the teachers and the students. And we have some slides that we'd like to share with you that tells a little bit about Next Life Foundation. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the deacons for um, including Next Life Foundation in the deacon cause for the month. That was uh, really awesome. And this, um, like Donna said, we went to Africa and we left a few days early so we could make sure we get out to this school. And uh, okay, put the next slide up. This is basically what the school looks like on the left is the sewing, and they call it the, um, the uh, well, they teach, it's a two-year course to teach sewing. And I might add, it was a real shocker to me when we got there because this, I, I was in the furniture industry for 35 years and thought maybe I could help them with some of these things, but they have no electricity. So the sewing machine is a, you, we, you do your feet like my grandma did. And uh, so, and on the right is the carpentry shop. And then in, in between is a little uh, outdoor restroom facility. Okay, next slide. And here we see some pictures of um, the tailoring classes in session. And mostly it's, it's a little hard to tell. Mostly those are girls. Um, they, they, it's hot and they seem to keep their hair cut real short. You have to, you have to um, be careful because you don't, not sure if it's a boy or a girl at first. Okay, next slide. Um, the carpentry class, I thought for sure I'd be able to help my entire career in, in woodworking, but again, there's no electricity. So it's hand augers, hand planes, uh, everything is done with chisels and hammers, and uh, yeah, it, I was uh, taken aback by that. Even, even when Donna and I lived in Vietnam and, and uh, Thailand and Cambodia, and it, they're ahead of, of these folks. These folks are the poorest of the poor. Um, and what this school does is try to to teach them a trade. Okay, next slide. And devotions, and, and every day they do what they call morning glory, and even and then they, in the, before they go home, they thank uh, the safe travels. Okay, next. Here's some inside the school, the uh, singing and uh, worship. Okay, next. Some of the students ride their bikes for hours each way to get to this school. So there's no public transportation. ride on the back of a motorcycle. Okay, next. And here's uh, the carpentry course. They make tables and they've, they've gone to schools and renovated in, in tailoring. They made this shirt. They literally measured me when I went there in the morning and when we left in the evening, this, they had this little jacket made for me. Okay, next. And you can see they like, uh, this is the graduation class, and they, they love the flashy colors, and they're just beautiful people. 
and Donna and I really fell in love with them. And um, let's see, is there another slide or is that it? Okay, now, this was real interesting. So since they're non-electric sewing machines, they can set up shop anywhere. And here's on the picture on the left was someone out in their front yard under a shade tree and same on the right. And then the next slide, this, they, we found the, this lady, uh, she rented a spot and the lady on the right is set up in front of, that's considered a grocery store there. So next slide. Uh, that's it. Okay. Well, so thank you very much. And um, there are uh, trifolds. Um, they look like this that tell all about it. And the uh, it's uh, nextlifefound.org uh, is the website. Look it up. It tells all about it. So again, thank you. Will you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we've gathered this morning called by you from the wherever and the whatever of our lives to offer to you our collective worship. Some of us have had a very good week and we come with light hearts and joy in the Lord. Some of us have had a difficult week and we come with heavy hearts and questions for our Lord. Some of us have had a busy week of ups and downs with little time to focus on our Lord. We all come asking you to receive our praise such as it is, to hear our petitions muddled though they be, and to reveal yourself to us more fully. We thank you for your word here faithfully preached and that hearing that word reveals to us the word made flesh, the hope of our hearts. At this time of the year especially, we thank you too for revealing yourself in your creation. As we spend more time outside, surrounded by growing things, we glimpse just a bit of what a marvelous God you are. Flowers, from marigolds and morning glories to orchids and oleander, remind us of your beauty. Trees, from evergreens and oaks to flowering pears and palms, call us to look up and remember your strength. As our gardens bless us with tomatoes and peppers and zucchini, we remember that you supply our needs. As we harvest basil, oregano, sage, and rosemary to flavor our food, we know that you give our lives interest and meaning. Creator of seemingly endless variety, who enriches our lives with countless colors and shapes and textures and tastes, we bring to you our praise. As we observe the birds of the heavens, sometimes hummingbirds and finches visiting our patios, and sometimes eagles and hawks joining us on a hike, we catch our breath at yet another glimpse of your handiwork. Tropical fish of all colors of the rainbow, our pets that become our companions, animals we can only see at the zoo, elephants and giraffes and lions and wildebeest all remind us of your power and strength and imagination and attention to detail. Daily views of hills and mountains, of beaches and ocean views, put us in awe of their creator and ours. No sunset is a rerun. Every moonrise and the bright stars and planets that decorate the night sky prompt us to thank you for revealing yourself to us in the universe that you have made. More than all of this, we thank you that your word tells us that the great creator God loves us and cares for us and calls us his own. We must confess that we are better at appreciating differences in flowers and tropical fish and garden herbs than we are at embracing differences in the crowning glory of your creation, humankind. 
We confess that we have been slow to accept people who do not look like us or talk like us or live like us. We gravitate towards those we recognize, sometime to the exclusion of others. Forgive our provincialism, Heavenly Father. Show us how our lives can be richer as we learn to respect and love your children across the globe and in neighborhoods we tend to avoid. Prompt us to learn about other cultures and thus appreciate the beauty of the human tapestry that you are weaving as you call all peoples and all nations to yourself. Save us from ourselves when pride makes us act like we are the best version of those created in your image. As we enjoy your creation this summer and are delighted by its complexity and diversity and beauty, help us to feel the same delight in one another and in others we meet. Teach us to embrace complexity and diversity and beauty in all people created in the image of God. For the body here at Crossroads, calm any fears, ease any worries, open our minds, open our hearts. Please heal the sick, grant patience to those who are dealing with the infirmities of old age, and give strength to those caring for them. As we open your word, give Pastor Jeff the words that you want us to hear and make us eager to do your will this week. Please bless our summers with safety, rest, recreation, and a renewed delight in the beauty of everything that you have created and of everyone that you have created. As we have experienced your grace, enable us through your spirit, we pray, to face with grace the challenges of this week. We pray all of this only in the name of Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Amen. Well, normally when I share announcements of, of Things that are happening is generally about things that are coming up this week, but today the two announcements I have are things that are not happening this week. Um, the first is that we were going to have a meet and greet where people could get to know Ryan Powell better, whether as our, our youth director or as our worship director, um, but COVID. Um, so we're postponing that by two weeks, so we will be doing that again with, with Ryan. That'll be after worship around 11 o'clock over in the loft. So whether you have a student in the ministry or you just like to get to know him better, it's a good opportunity um, to, to do that. Uh, the other is we were going to have um, our, our art table in the back, which we normally have, but our art teachers are away right now, so we will not be having the art tables in the back. But if kids are interested, we do still have the stuff back there, and you can sit at the tables, or if adults, you would just rather sit at a table than, than in a chair. Um, well, you'd still be sitting in a chair, but not in a row, I guess you would say. So those, those are still open, but we don't have our, our art teachers back there as we normally do. Um, the thing I don't have a slide for at this point, sorry, Linda, it's a totally audible on you, is that we do have um, coffee this, this Tuesday at 10 a.m. outside. Uh, should be a wonderful time of, of sharing and fellowship with one another. So do invite you, encourage you to come to that. Well, now is the time in worship that we bring our offerings to God. This whole time is, is a time of worship. This whole time that we are gathered here is when we are giving offerings of praise in our lives to God, but now is that point in the service when we give monetarily to him. We give it as, as a symbol of, of our worship, as a symbol of giving everything that we have to him. We give out of obedience to him. So I do invite our ushers and our deacons who are going to be receiving our offering to come forward. And, and as they do, um, don't want you to feel any obligation if you're visiting with us to, to put anything into the offering plate, but we do welcome you. And actually, one thing I forgot to do earlier is we do have these connect cards. So if you want to fill those out, if you're new with us and drop those into the plate, or if you have prayer requests, welcome.
Well, as we prepare to hear God's word, I invite you to pray with me. Well, Father God, we thank you for Scripture. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, this, this good news that we get to read from, not only when we are in worship, but, but when we are at home, when we are going about our business. Lord, help us to be in your word. Help us to seek you and to, to find you and to know who you are because you have revealed who you are to us. So Lord, now as we open these scriptures, we ask that you would prepare our hearts, that you would prepare our minds. Lord, that, that as we read, that we would grow closer to you, that we would know more about you so that we might worship you, so that we might enjoy this life that we have in you, that we might serve you, that we might do your will. So Lord, now as always, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and honoring and glorifying to you. Jesus, you are our rock, you are our redeemer. It is in your name that we pray, amen. Well, as children grow up, there's certain milestones, certain things that you look forward to. Uh, when kids are little, it's their first steps, or maybe it's their first day of kindergarten. As they get older, it's the first day of middle school, or their first time behind the wheel. Another first that happens, another milestone that can happen, is when you finally leave your kids at home alone when you go out, maybe for the evening. Now, you hope that you have instilled wisdom in them, that they would make good choices while you are gone. Um, but as you walk out the door, it's rather instinctive for parents just to say, well, I, let me tell you one more thing, just, just to make sure that, that you're okay. We have to give these last minute instructions. And first, you wanna make sure that your children are safe. Now, remember to turn the stove off. Uh, don't open the door for any kind of strangers. And as you are walking through that door yourself, you want to give them that one final most important message. You say, I love you as you're walking out the door. Well, in Romans 16, Paul is putting the finishing touches on this letter, and he's trying to instill in them just a few more things that are important for them to take on. And he gives them some last-minute instructions before he moves on, and also just one final most important message. After he has given them some warnings and, in, and attempting to keep them safe, he has one final message for them. So I invite you to hear now the word of the Lord as it comes to us from Romans chapter 16, the final verses of Romans, verse 17 through 27. God's word says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have, you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving the Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. Timothy, my co-worker, sends his greetings to you, as do Lucius, Jason, and Sisypiter, my fellow Jews. I, Tertius, who wrote down this letter, greet you in the Lord. Gaius, whose hospitality I and the whole church here enjoy, sends you his greetings. Erastus, who is the city's director of public works, and our brother Quartus send their greetings as well. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith, to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So these are the final words of Romans. And in this conclusion that Paul has written out has, as he has ended this letter, there are three sections, kind of three final messages that we find. We find a warning, we find final greetings, and there is a doxology or a song of praise. So that first part, 
in verse 17 through 20, leading up to those verses, um, Paul's readers and listeners could probably pick up the cues that this letter is coming to an end. You know, he's been greeting the people. He's giving some of these, some of these final greetings. But here in verse 17, Paul might throw his leader, readers for a bit of a loop, and he has this strong warning that is right in the middle because you have, you have greetings and you have a warning, and then you have greetings again. So it might have felt a little strange for them. And it kind of reminds me of if you're on the, a phone call with somebody and you can tell that it's coming to an end. You know, they're saying things like, hey, it was great talking to you. I should probably get going. You know, uh, talk to you soon. Tell your dad I said hello. But then they drop this on you. They say, oh, yeah, just well, one more thing. And that one more thing turns out to be a pretty heavy subject. Now, in chapter 14, which we studied several weeks ago, uh, Paul taught extensively about building unity in the church, saying that we are not to condemn one another because we disagree over disputable doctrine. But now, in verse 17 through 20, he circles back to that subject again, back to that subject to saying, well, what if people disagree? What if people are believing and teaching different things? And here, his words actually become really strict. His words become very strong. Before, he was very conciliatory and saying, hey, we don't need to divide over these things. But now, it gets tougher. And we find that tension that is within the book of Romans when we have grace for one another, but we also need to be wise. He tells them, watch out. For those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching that you have learned. Keep away from them, for such people are not serving the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive and innocent people. So it kind of brings us back to that parent who is leaving the house for the first time. They're warning their children to be careful. And it, it's not just don't burn the house down, be careful, there is that, but it is also, watch out, don't open the door for strangers, because there are dangerous people out there. Paul warns us, Paul warns the church back then, he also warns us today that, that there are people even in the church who are threats to the health of the church and to the gospel itself. So be alert, listen closely to what people are teaching. This is, a warn, this is a warning to be on the lookout for what we would call false teaching. Now, although Romans 14, we're told we should not condemn fellow believers over certain theological matters, here in Romans 16, we see that we cannot ignore false teaching in the name of getting along, in the name of creating some veneer of unity. Paul tells us to watch out because as these people are teaching these things that are not true, these things that are destructive, we don't know exactly what is being taught there. We know he said, hey, you don't need to, to divide over disputable things. But he's saying you need to be careful about this because what they are doing is actually causing division. We don't receive division by going, eh, everything's fine. Believe whatever you want to believe and we're fine. No, what these people are doing, what they are teaching, is actually causing division within the church. We need to watch out because it is being fractured. And we're doing, and they're doing this, we're told, with smooth talk and flattery. What they're teaching sounds impressive. It might even sound biblical. They might be pulling out scripture. They might cherry-pick verses out of context, which on the surface appear to support what they are teaching. But when you get down to it, are false and deceptive and dangerous. God warns us that these people might even be effective communicators. They might be a, di a dynamic speaker, a charismatic leader who draw people in with compelling words. But in truth, what they are actually doing so much of the time is appealing to our own human fallen desires, the things of this world, the values of this world that we have taken on as our own. You know, that whole thing of don't be conformed, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He's saying, if we are conformed by the pattern of this world, and we buy into the values of this world, then the teachings that come into the church and the outside that are dangerous can draw us in, can appeal to us, 
because we're thinking more like the world than we are thinking like Jesus Christ, and we are thinking about the kingdom of God. So he's saying, watch out when people are doing this. It's very appealing. It's very compelling. It draws you in. All these great things that they're saying God wants for you, money and wealth and power, but they're teaching you falsehood. Watch out for those who are teaching what is contrary to the gospel. Don't believe every word that comes out of the pastor's mouth, whether this pastor or another pastor. Check it against God's word. That's why we give you this encouragement each time. Hey, reread the passage that we just read. Read the passage before that. Read the passage after that. You cannot just take the word of a pastor just because they have said it. Even if they have a large number of followers, a large number of book sales. We need to be careful who we are listening to. And even as we're careful who we're listening to, that the people that we trust, that what they are saying is still true. Now we know that not all sources of inaccurate teaching are nefarious. It's not like everybody who's out there who's teaching falsehood is intending to do damage to the, the, the church of Jesus Christ. But not all people are also being honest. Some of the people may just get caught up in, in some exciting, intriguing new interpretation of Scripture. But there is also this darker element that Paul points out here. He says, these are the people we truly need to be careful about. It says, watch out for those who put obstacles in your way. For such people are not serving our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own appetites. Now that word obstacles came up recently, came up several weeks ago when we were looking again at Romans 14. See, we're doing this balance kind of between Romans 14 and Romans 16. Romans 14 talked about we don't want to put any stumbling block or any obstacle in the way of our brother or sister. We don't want to cause them to stumble and to fall by the way that we exercise and enjoy our own freedoms. And there were those two words that were in there. There was, there was stumbling block and there was obstacle. And a stumbling block is something that is placed in a path left behind unintentionally. There's no, you know, m maliciousness to it. But sometimes it's careless. And sometimes we will do things unintentionally, not even recognizing that we are causing someone else harm. So that's being a stumbling block. We're called not to be a stumbling block. But here in this passage, it says, these are people who are placing obstacles in your way. An obstacle, that Greek word there for obstacle, is something that is left there on purpose. It is meant there to trip somebody up. Paul is warning about people who are not serving the Lord, but are serving their own appetites. They're serving their own pride. These are people who are using the Word of God for their own purposes, for money, for power, for influence, for prestige. So in verse 17, again, these are hard words again from Paul. From the conciliatory, hey, don't judge each other harshly, don't contem condemn one another. He's saying, but you do need to be careful. Keep away from these people. Steer clear. I like what Eugene Peterson does with, with the message paraphrase many times, and this is one of those times. And it says, give these people a wide berth. Later on, when I'm going to encourage you to read this passage again, um, one of the things I would recommend is take a look at it in different translations, maybe your NIV or English Standard Version, maybe your message as well. So he says, give these people a wide berth. In, in verse 19, Paul encourages these church, the, these, the people of this church in Rome. He says, everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you. But then again, he warns them. He says, you're doing great, but, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. And here, he's kind of 
echoing the words of Jesus. In, in Matthew 10, Jesus was sending out the 12 disciples. This is before his death and resurrection, before, before he actually, you know, gives the Great Commission to the church. He's sending out his disciples and saying, hey, it's time for you to go. It's time for you to go and, and declare the good news and to preach, and you're going to heal, and you're going to drive out demons. But he says to them, he says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. What Jesus is saying, what, what Paul is saying here, what God is telling us is that we do need to pay attention to what we are taking in. Not only from the world, because obviously we don't want to take in everything that the world is feeding to us, especially the values of the world. But also we need to be careful what we are taking in from within the church, who we're listening to, what we're being taught. See, when disagreements expand and grow beyond these disputable matters and devolve into quarreling over the foundational teachings of the church, of the gospel, and especially when we are dealing with false teachers who are putting obstacles in other people's ways, who are causing division and dissension, there comes a point where we simply cannot abide it anymore, and we have to say, this is enough, and we need to speak that difficult truth. So that is that hard, oh, one more thing, before Paul continues on. And here, at the end of that, Paul does continue on, and he sends some greetings. He sends greetings, before he had sent greetings, saying, hey, say hello to, to, to Phoebe, and say hello to all these great people who are at the church there. But now he's sending greetings from the people who are with him. Remember, he's in Corinth as he's writing this letter. People like Timothy, who had traveled and served with Paul. People like Tertius. Tertius was the one who was the scribe who was writing down these words that Paul was speaking. People like Erastus, who was a Christian and a government official in the city there. So that's that, that greeting that he gives. Then after these final greetings that he has given, as Tertius is dotting the I's and crossing the T's, Paul bursts into this joyous, doxology. It's this hymn of praise and glory to God. And now it starts off pretty straightforward, which you might expect. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel. He starts off with his praise of who God is and what God has done. And then he brings it home in the final phrase there at the end of 27. He says, to the only wise God be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. But then right in the middle of this doxology that he is singing, praying, shouting the glory of God, Paul can't help himself, and he just starts talking and shares this amazing one long run-on sentence. So I put it in a little bit smaller font so it would all fit there. He says, Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel— the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic writings by the command of the eternal God, so that all the Gentiles might come to the obedience that comes from faith to the only wise God, be glory forever through Jesus Christ. <sighs> that is one long, drawn-out sentence, because Paul is just so excited to be sharing what he is sharing. Paul blurts it, all, blurts it all out at once. And it feels kind of like his, his, his mouth can't keep up with his brain because he's got so many great things to say. And, and I kind of imagine being Tertius, right? Because Paul is talking, and Tertius is writing all these things out on the papyrus and, and, and preparing it, and go, okay, okay slow down. What did you say there? And, and trying to keep up with what Paul is saying, going, all right, I'll do my best. Now, most of Paul's letters end with a blessing. Like in Ephesians, peace to the brothers and sisters and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. But here in Romans, after laying out this amazing description of the grace of Jesus Christ and the providence and beautiful wisdom of God, Paul ends his letter with this doxology, this song of praise. And as he begins, he again tells us what God has done. Now, sometimes people will, you know, at the end of a sermon, the end of a letter, will kind of sum things up and go, okay, 
this is what I, you know, I told you I was going to tell you, but I told you, now I'm telling you again. I don't know that Paul is trying to just sum everything up in, in, in one phrase. It feels so much like he is just overflowing with what God has done. And it is kind of this, I see it as this dance that, that Paul is engaging in, this dance with God, but this dance even with himself, and he's going back and forth between these two things. It is this time of worship, and he is praising God, but he is also declaring the wonders of what God has done, the glory of God, and each of these things is flowing back and forth between the two, between worship and between declaration of the good news, and worship and declaration of the good news. As he's worshiping, as he's saying, all praise to God for what he has done, then he just jumps right in. And let me remember all the things that he did. Look at all these amazing things that God did. So he gets so caught up in telling what God has done that he goes, isn't that amazing? Let's, I mean, glory to God for what he has done. And this is right after Paul has been saying, you need to be careful, you need to watch out. Then he's saying, this is the message. This is the gospel. Praise be to God. He is teaching with passion. He is teaching with joy. He tells the people, look what God has done. He has called you. He has strengthened you. Yes, even you Gentiles, who you thought, who everybody thought were outside, were not part of God's family. He has brought you in. Praise be to God. And he had all this plan from the very beginning. He's saying that it's not like God changed his mind. God hadn't cast aside the Gentiles and said, I don't care about you people. I never have. I never will. He says, no, I've always cared about you. I always called my Jewish people first, the people of Israel first, but it was always my intention to bring these people in. I even gave you clues about it long ago from the very beginning. Paul is so thrilled. He is so excited to be preaching what is going on here. Isn't God amazing? God has finally revealed it. We get to see it. I get to teach about it. I get to tell people about it. I get to invite people in. Isn't this amazing? To God be the glory forever and ever. So it's this amazing conclusion from Paul. Preaching with joy, talking about all that God has done and his response to that is to say all glory to God. Well, we have spent the last 20 weeks studying the book of Romans. We talked about sin and grace. We talked about redemption and restoration, the sovereignty of God, how we are saved by grace through faith, not by our own works, and that even faith is a gift from God. We talked about this new life that we're called to live in, living in obedience to him, how we're called to live together as one, as the body of Christ, this unity that is so important that we need to foster, that we need to protect, and how then we as individuals and as the body of Christ are sent out to share the good news with the world. Now along the way, we've studied and gone through and learned some pretty heavy and important things theology, some important teachings that God has for us. But as we wrap up Romans and as we reflect back on what we've learned, it isn't enough to say, wow, Romans was really interesting. I learned a lot about God. Or even Romans really challenged me. When we look back at Romans, our response must be the same as of Paul himself. That as we look back, we would soak it in and say, remember what we learned, all these amazing, amazing things about God. The deep, deep love of Jesus, the brilliance and the mercy and the majesty of God. And our response to all of that is to burst into song like Paul did. All glory to him. Well, in these final moments of our, of our time together talking about Romans. I do want to give you just a few possible ways that you might take the Word of God and do something with it. 
So a bit of, of application there. The first is an encouragement for you to read Romans 16, verse 17 through 27. And really focus in on that, on that doxology. It's, all the other parts are important, but really focus in on that doxology in 25 through 27. And again, read it in a couple different translations. I know I always tell you that, but I always tell you that for a reason. Because it is important. You hear different words, you hear different phrasing of it. And then what part of Paul's description of God makes you praise him? Not just to say, oh, that's interesting. I hadn't really thought about that before. But to say, when I'm reading through this and really dive into it, when I'm reading through this and reading about the nature of God and the love of God and the glory of God, what part of that makes me go, wow, praise God. Look what God has done. So that's number one. Number two is in response to that, worship God this week. Not just here when you're in this place, but worship God throughout this week. Worship God for who he is according to what we have read in Romans, for what he has done, for his grace, for his mercy, for his wisdom, for all these amazing things that God has done. Worship him because of that. And, and that's where we come into, you know, there's the different ways that people will pray, and, and there's uh, the ACTS, acronym, you know, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. And adoration is what we're talking about here, is to adore God for who he is. God, because of who you are, you know, pray through that, that the doxology of, of Romans 17, 25 through, tw through 27, 16, 25 through 27. Read through that and praise God for who he is. Not just, you know, thank you, God, for, for, for health, and thank you, God, for, for getting me through difficult times, but praising God, worshiping God for who he is. There's always a place and a time for thanking God for answers to prayer, but there is also just time to say, God, I love you, and I thank you, and I praise you for who you are. So that's, that's one encouragement. Another is listen to worship music and actually sing along. Now, I'm not saying you always have to listen to worship music all the time, but it is a great gift to just escape the noise of this world, whether you're in your vehicle by yourself or you're listening on your phone, in your room, whatever it may be. Take some time and listen to worship music and maybe even sing along. And then the final is actually write out your own doxology. Use what, what, what has been written here in Romans chapter 16. Use it as a guide, but write out your own doxology, your own song of praise. And then if you really want to spend some time, reread the book of Romans this week and see that big, amazing story, all this amazing work that God has done. Take God's word in and respond to it. The ultimate purpose of theology is to teach people the truth about God but it's to teach people the truth about God for a purpose. And that purpose is so that we might worship him more effectively and more passionately. So our response to the good news of God's grace and his love for us is to worship him with joy and with passion. As I pray, I want to invite our, our worship team to come up and to prepare to lead us in our final song. God, you have revealed so much of who you are through the book of Romans. Lord, we thank you for the gift that this book has been for these past 20 weeks, for the gift that this book has been for the last 2,000 years, and for the gift that it will continue to be. Lord, help us to not just see this as an interesting study of Romans, a, a time where we learned a bit more about you. But Lord, call us to worship. Help us to see who you are and the love you have for us. Lord, our own broken nature, our own sin, our own deservedness of your wrath. But Lord, help us also to see your grace and your love and your compassion and your mercy for us. Lord, help us to glorify you. Help us to worship you. Help us to sing our songs of praise to you. Help us to write words of praise to you. Help our lives to be a doxology to you. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand with us as, uh, as we continue in an attitude of worship responding to the message. Just to 
All of our praise rises to the one who is strong enough to make you strong, exactly as preached in Jesus Christ, precisely as revealed in the mystery kept secret for so long, but now an open book through the prophetic scriptures. All the nations of the world can now know the truth and be brought into obedient belief, carrying out the orders of God who got all this started down to the very last letter. All our praise is focused through Jesus on this incomparably wise God. Amen. My friends, we have experienced, we have heard the good news of Jesus Christ, and our response is to worship him. Our, our response is to live our lives as an act of worship for him. So now as you go from this place, knowing this good news, experiencing, recognizing, living in this good news, May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Father God. 